I'm a personal trainer and you're seeing me in this environment. I started my personal training career maybe 20 years ago with the franchiseeship we tend to call them, so I don't know if many of you are aware, but we're actually subcontractors generally in gyms, so we pay rent each week and we build our businesses independently. So I started with Fitness First in South Yarra and then I became a personal trainer out at Knox, so I live out this way. And then they changed me to Glen Waverley, so I was a personal training manager, sorry, at Knox and Glen Waverley in a bit of group fitness management. And then the gym went through a lot of changeovers and I went through a lot of redundancy rounds and there were takeovers and the third one, they were actually taken over by Good Life and the people who owned Good Life. And, uh, but I took my redundancy then and I went to teaching the fitness courses. So I was working for TAFE, teaching the certificate three and four in fitness and some courses in diplomas and sport and recreation and that sort of thing. So I'm a survivor in the fitness industry. Fortunately, my career's evolved and I've been had a good experience throughout this last 20 years doing what I love. So what I've noticed though, what I noticed when I was working with clients initially as a personal trainer, and I'm sure some of you in professions that require upskilling would know what I mean. When you have to do professional development, We'd have to do that very regularly and I'd learn and evolve all my training skills. But what I began to notice is it didn't matter what I knew if people didn't turn up. And it didn't matter what information I gave people if they didn't implement it. If I'd only see them for half an hour, an hour, a couple of times a week, it was very difficult, obviously, for me to do much more than make sure that session was what they needed at that point of time with their desired goal in mind. So what became most obvious to me is how people are in fact their own worst enemies and their self-talk. So I just hear the way that people would be talking about themselves and why they're not doing things that they feel they should be doing and why they are doing the things that they think they shouldn't be doing. And so I could see there was a real mismatch between people's intentions and their behaviours. And that kind of got me really curious. I worked out that the only way I could really have a more powerful contribution to the people I was in front of was to be able to get them to understand a little bit about their mindset as well and their motivators and what actually wasn't working for them. So we don't really need to know what is working for us if it's working for us. And I think relationships are a good example of that. We know what works in some relationships, the attraction, if it's in your work environment, what works, you do your job, you get paid, it's, you know, it works. It's only when things aren't working that we need to draw our attention to developing resources to how we can get the things working in our life that aren't working for us. And so I started to study different things. So the first thing I actually did was neuro-linguistic programming, which I don't know if any of you know about that. Anyone who's been in sales, some levels of management, HR, it is actually understanding talk, language, our self-talk. And that was the most interesting thing because you learn about your own self-talk and language. And I was immediately able to apply that with my clients because I would hear their self-talk and be able to do what we call reframing, is sort of repeat what they're saying back to them in a way that actually shifts the energy to make it a positive statement rather than a negative statement. So an example of that would be, I, I guess what I go on a lot about is how I hate it when I, I do this sort of behaviour, for example. And so I would reframe that to something about, along the lines of, so you're actually looking forward to when you're going to find a strategy or be able to do something else instead of that that's going to bring you the energy that you want or the outcomes that you want. So you see from that statement that the language is very different. And energetically, even when I give these talks and I talk about this, when I make a negative statement, I can feel that energy sort of inhabit me. 
When I change that to a positive statement, I am looking forward to, it gives me somewhere to go. If I go about a task looking forward to the outcome rather than berating myself for what I'm not doing or haven't been doing properly, there's energy in that. So I just began to understand this and then I was fortunate enough, I um, did my certificate for hypnotherapy and then evolved that skill. I'm now a, a clinical hypnotherapist and psychotherapist and the NLP is combined in all of that. I've done more master prep training recently with Tad James, which if anyone knows this stuff, he's kind of the guy, except unfortunately he's not here anymore, but his wife does a lot of that, Adriana. So that's brought in the master NLP practitioner, timeline therapist. I utilise that a lot in my hypnotherapy sessions. And then I've gone the obvious way, people like myself go to coaching. So we all see this coaching, but I have just finished my coaching accreditation specifically as a mindset and goal orientated coach to really meet people with what their goal is and then we establish a path to get there. So this is why what I'm going to be speaking about today is of course in the gym environment I'm going to cover and this is what this college sheet is a bit about training and then I'm going to talk about mindset because uh, and as someone mentioned before, and as Avery mentioned, the doctor's saying about keep, um, this type of diet not being sustainable, no diet is really sustainable when we're just focused on the weight loss element of it. When we can get our mindset in the right uh, place about what we're enjoying about the outcomes of a healthy lifestyle, then things are achievable. When we see it as a temporary means to an end, we always have a goal in mind, and when we get there, we blow out and we get in this up and down cycle. So we need big picture goals with this sort of thing. Um, I guess, and I also have my businesses, is that my time already? Is that so, um, like I'm, what is that, at the Oscars? <laughs> yeah, but I'm getting, <laughs> <laughs> Finally get my time and I'm getting... So also, so I set up my businesses along the way with Juvenile Hypnotherapy and I run health retreats in here as well. So that's that one. So I'm just going to click back to this uh, talk on fitness and obviously I have a fair bit to say so I'm going to try and condense it oops, as much as possible. Um, I do have the resources to send through and obviously if you want me to expand on anything we can discuss that a bit later. So this talk is predominantly where it leads to is understanding high intensity interval training. <coughs> and it, as I said in the fitness industry for quite some time and you would all know in the diet industry and in all areas of life there's a bombardment of information. First it's this fad, then it's that fad and it keeps changing and people finish up getting confused. The interesting thing was I was kind of around when this HIIT training came in and it stayed because the science behind it is indisputable about how this is the most efficient way to get yourself fit fast. So this is all about training smarter, not harder. And the reason this is so important is time is often a reason that people for not being able to exercise and I know when I first joined a gym years ago you'd get a program written up and then your cardio element and it was an hour or so all in this and so then time can become an obstacle these days when I think about exercising if it were in a gym I'd think half an hour and get in there get it done get out and it can even be done in less when we're talking pure hip training so I'm sure you've all heard about it, but it's actually the, um, which direction is it? Oh, I haven't put the USB. So I just got that um, doing its thing. So when we talk about weight loss, people say, I want to lose weight. Now, when you work in the industry that I work in, actually, the language we use is we want to shift our body composition. And, and as was touched on about the benefit of strength training, what we need to understand, if you go on an extreme diet to lose weight, you don't have your proteins, etc., your 
you're at risk of losing perhaps lean muscle, fluid. So what we actually want to look at, you'll see weight loss consists of loss of body fat, lean muscle and water. So effectively when we look at shifting our body composition, we want to have less body fat if that's our goal, to lose weight. And then we want to have other factors that contribute that increase our metabolism. And so we want to have more muscle mass. So we actually want to begin to shift the dynamic and that takes us away from the language. And keep in mind I'm obsessed by language. It takes away that word loss, I need to lose weight. It is not a motivator. It's, a, it's I need to shift my body composition so that it works for me. So, <coughs> yes, yeah, so, did I just miss something there? No. No. So that just touches <coughs> on a lot of these weight loss products, very low calorie diets and meal replacements, etc. Um, they aren't necessarily just targeting fat loss. If they're not done intelligently, we can lose lean muscle mass, and I'll explain to you in a moment why that's an issue, outside of obvious reasons, of course. So, there's a bit of science here, but I find this knowledge is power. When people understand this, they understand that you can start just getting out and doing 10 minutes a day of something, and it is infinitely better than nothing. So, What's missing, what traditional methods are missing, which we talk about the steady state aerobic exercise here. So people who think that to lose weight and get fit, walking for an hour is a goal. Or I'm going to go to the gym and walk on the treadmill for half a minute at a steady state. And I'll, I'll ex this will play out as to why that's challenging. So when you're in a steady state, just doing something, thinking while well, I'm walking, people will come in and say, well, you exercise, I'll walk for an hour every day. It's actually quite efficient for these reasons, and I'm going to speak to what EPOC is in a moment, and basal metabolic rate, uh, there's an issue there. So this excessively long duration cardio that people think they need to do, and that's how they're going to lose weight, actually strips away lean muscle mass, potentially, because you're, burning through body fat and when you've exhausted fuel supplies it can begin to work at eating its way through our muscle mass and you can see with marathon runners you know that really lean physical type and unfortunately sometimes they cross over when they run out of fuel to actually impacting their lean muscle and so this adaption to the training, so rapid adaption to the training can result in a plateau. So that's what a plateau is. When we do the same thing consistently, our body thinks it's a new normal. If I walk the dog every morning for an hour, my body thinks that is all the energy, that uh, this is what I do in a day, I do that, I do that, I do that, then the body adjusts its metabolism and my dietary intake if I've reduced calories to make sure I can do those activities and it just forms a plateau. So actually, except for the dog being happy, you're getting all of the positive um, mental, emotional sort of, we know that exercise is healthy, those responses, from a weight loss or cardiovascular effect, you're not really doing much at all. So, when we talk about EPOC, now this, this is the key, and this is why I'm persisting with this technolo technologically sort of based uh, presentation, is when we challenge our cardiovascular system, what it actually produces is an effect when we challenge it properly that when we stop exercising, doing the cardiovascular activity, we get an outcome where our body is still having to process and adapt to the exercise and our metabolism is still heightened. So we, I think we all know what metabolism is and we all know what it's like to have a sluggish metabolism and we all, I think, know that when we're carrying weight, body fat is a very dense weight and it actually reduces our metabolism. But lean muscle mass, the more lean muscle mass we have, the higher our metabolism is. So we don't need to starve ourselves down with fat loss and decrease our metabolism 
We need to train with strength training, be intelligent about what we're doing, eat more proteins, and increase our body's ability to increase our metabolic rate. And then we can eventually eat more. So it's quite the opposite to the traditional thing, I need to eat less and exercise more. So um, it says here that it's me measurably increased rate of oxygen intake following strenuous activity. And I think that's that strenuous level when you stop and you think of sprinters and athletes and they kind of go, <gasps> like th that's pulling the oxygen back into the system. So this is what we're looking at creating. And th this really, um, the extra oxygen is used in the process that restores the body to a resting state and adapt it to the exercise just performed. So it's increasing the metabolism to be able to adapt. This also includes replacing hormones, replenishment of fuel stores, cellular repair. So all of this is going on when we find the right level of exertion with our cardiovascular activity. All studies show that, this, that the higher level of um, exercise rate, which is what these coloured charts are, we'll go into that in a minute, increases the epoch and is more likely to give you a metabolic effect once you stop doing the exercise. The significant thing to know here is anything in those lower heart rate zones, your steady state exercise, the moment you stop doing that activity, the metabolic effect stops. So in contrast to strength training, the goal in strength training is when we are doing the activity, it increases our metabolism like exerting ourselves does, but when we stop, the body has to go into repair of the muscular system, sort of where producing micro tears, and the body has to go into recovery for a couple of days, effectively, like we go on a recovery arc down, and then the, the muscles begin to repair and build, and we come back up and we train again. We create fatigue and we come back up and train again. This is the metabolism having to work this whole time. So this is why strength training is so important. We get the metabolic benefit when we're doing it, we get the metabolic effect on an ongoing basis because we're increasing lean muscle mass. And the more lean muscle mass we have, the higher our metabolic rate. So cardio used to be poo-pooed in the gym, particularly by bodybuilders and so on, because it's just, you do it and it stops. But then HIIT training came in and they found the science as to how you can trick the cardiovascular system into continuing to have to recover once we stop exercising. And that's what our HIIT training is. So I think we know, I, I think COVID was a good way I uh, could explain basal metabolic rate. Your basal metabolic rate is kind of the amount of energy you expend while you're at rest. So, you know, on our COVID days when we're indoors all day and, and working from home, it's sort of gauging about how many calories we're burning in a rested state before we do anything. That's, and those new scales that you get, well, they're not new anymore, that you set up with your weight and your height and your age, they will run you through your body fat percentage and your basal metabolic rate. So they're a fairly good indicator. Um, So we say this aerobic fitness level, which is what I'll go into, this steady state, walking the dog, is a product of cardiovascular exercise. While previously thought to enhance basal metabolic rate, it's been shown in more recent research not really to contribute at all. And this is important to note. So also, what is happening, why people aren't getting results, is they're not reaching the intensity they need to, as I've been discussing, they do the same thing over and over again so the body never has to adapt. And they can be too busy watching TV or talking on the phone. And this is why I thought I'll include this slide. <laughs> Whilst exercising to actually focus on the intensity of their training. Um, so fat loss training is less about the amount of time devoted to the exercise and more about intensity. So if the intensity isn't there, the results won't be there either. So keys for fat loss, we want to burn calories through metabolic disturbance. So by pushing ourselves beyond a prior limit. 
Rising basal metabolic rate can be responsible for up to 60 to 70 percent of calories burnt per day. So we can become a lot more of a fat burning, calorie burning machine. And your fat loss training must promote maintenance on an increasing lean muscle mass. If we are losing lean muscle mass, we're chasing ourselves down because we have to starve ourselves <coughs> to burn up energy. And then we can compromise lean muscle mass, so our basal metabolic rate drops, and then we have to starve ourselves more. So it's the reverse of what we need to be doing. Um, so fat loss training rules. We must consider the calories burnt during and after the session, which is what I'm talking about with hidden strength training. We burn calories <coughs> after the session because of the effect of these effects that I've explained. How? So short periods of high intensity work into spurt fight with recovery periods, cycles of work rest, and this is where we're talking about high intensity work training. So here's some examples. So it's a strategy that's intended to improve performance with short training sessions. It's a form of cardiovascular exercise which is beneficial to burning fat in a short and intense workout. And the sessions range from, range from 15 to 30 minutes. So this is where they're time effective. When we're looking, so this is a time on time off ratio which I'll speak about. But what you're looking at, and for people who aren't a member of a gym, don't have cardio equipment, get yourself to the local park or a footy oval where it's soft because you, you want to be on a low impact surface. If we're, particularly if we're carrying excess weight and that's our motivation to exercise, the impact on the joints once we start moving quickly is <laughs> infinite and it's potential to injury of course, which is very common when people start, everyone, I want to lose weight, I've got to start running. And I mean, no. You need to start moving quickly, but running maybe, make sure your body is adapted to that. So the time on time off ration ratios can be two to one in terms of time. So for example, for a hip training session, it might be something like 60 seconds, just your light jog, then a 30 second sprint. So it's just getting your heart rate, your system warmed up, then something intense safe environments of bikes, cross trainers, rowing machines because there's no impact. But if you're outdoors and you've just got a park or something, a good soft surface, you would just sort of run a jog, what, what that is to you, you know, just to shuffle as quickly as you can, so we're around a footy on until you're puffed. And then you just walk and bring the heart rate down, then you do the same and you might start with three times around and then four times around and five times around but once you get to the period of time you've allocated maybe 20 minutes the goal is different to the past perceptions that i need to go longer and get to 30 minutes and 40 minutes and an hour it's actually now in that 20 minutes if you're doing six laps you want to work at getting seven done in 20 minutes and then eight done in 20 minutes because that's forcing your assist to adapt every time and reach maximum heart rate, which is what I'll get to. Studies have shown this method to be more effective at burning fat and maintaining or building muscle mass than high volume, lower intensity aerobic workouts. One study demonstrated two and a half hours of sprint interval training produced a similar biomechanical, biochemical muscle charge changes to 10.5 hours of endurance training, along with similar performance benefits. The BMR, the basal metabolic rate, is increased for the following 24 hours once we manage to get the intensity that has this EPOC effect, and it may improve our cardiovascular activity more effectively than doing only this a traditional long cardio workout. So I think I've sort of gotten that point across. So this is what this handout is for you to take. Now we're looking at heart rate training zones here. This is how you know when you get to that level you need to, to create EPOC. You have to spike your heart rate to a certain level to force this recovery to occur. So on those sheets you'll see to calculate your maximum heart rate, the textbook sort of calculation is 220 minus your age. 
But that cheat sheet is a cheat sheet, really, because it's got your age up the top here, and it's got the percentage of your maximum heart rate here. So this steady state we're talking about is generally in here. You know when you've gone up here when you're walking and talking with a friend or someone and you can't talk anymore, you've sort of shifted up here. As I was saying before with this high intensity interval train running, you know, in a park or somewhere close, moving quickly, slowing down, quickly slowing down, hills, a goal. Just start walking up a hill. Halfway up, if you have to rest, rest. So, they're easy go-tos, you don't have to be a member of the gym. But here's your age, here's the percentage of your heart rate, there's that sheet there for you to calculate it as well. So, to stimulate the chemical effect you need to produce this EPOC, this exercise post-oxygen consumption, you want to spike up in that 90 to 100 percent. So I imagine it like those old American movies, you know, you'd see them at the fair and they'd have that hammer and they'd be hit, hitting the thing and it would send it up and ring the bell. This is what we're doing in high intensity interval training. You don't have to hang around up there. You just need to land up there for long enough for the body to then have to go into recovery of that fuel source later. So this is where this knowledge is power because for you, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, you know when you're there because you're so puffed you have to stop. And the liberating thing about understanding this is it gets us out of self-punishment because I used to think, and we all think we go to, as I said, run or do this intense exercise after not doing anything for ages, and we move quickly and we, we, we can only last moving quickly for a very short period of time and we think, oh, I'm just so unfit and we start hating on ourselves, which goes back to what I was talking before about mindset. But once you understand when you are up in this level of intensity, the body only has enough fuel. The fuel the body has to produce for you to move quickly that's stored in the muscles and other areas of the body burns out after 15 seconds. And it forces you to come back to other fuel sources. You know, here we're down in fat burning mode. That's why ultimately fat gets burned. So you can stop dumping on yourself when you move quickly and you last long. You can think, I have to stop. Yes, I must have hit my maximum heart rate. It's gold. It's not, oh my gosh, I'm so unfit. I can't stay here long. This is why you look at sprinters, you, you say bolt, you know, they're looking at the sprint under 10 seconds. This is the fuel source they're using. And you look at their time for the t um, 200 metre sprint, it's double their 100 metre sprint. I've checked this because they're still got enough of that fuel left, you know, then they're at 20 seconds. Then those fuel reserves are gone and their energy system's pulled back down. So their 400 metres will be a bit longer because they don't have the fuel. They've got the fitness and the legs and the body adaptability. The fuel's not there. So be nice to yourself <laughs> and celebrate being exhausted and having to stop and rest because you've done what you need to do. When you rest, you want to just come back down to about here. So, you know, your rest isn't that I might just call my friend in between or whatever. It's, it's when you know you're ready to just have a bit of an, an exertion again. So, I've given suggestions for people who don't have cardiovascular equipment, who don't like going into gyms. If you are in a gym, as I mentioned before, cross trainer is my favourite one. You know, this thing where people go like that. I never use the arm thing because, you know, I walk behind people and see their bodies all contorted and it's really not good. You know, this is going that way, that's going that way. If you're tall and you're fine, I use the handles in the middle and I ground myself and just go. So periods on, periods off. If it's something of interest to you, I have a bit of a guide for people somewhere. Um, rowing machines, but it's hard to spend long on a rowing machine. I did once, get, um, but that was that. Bikes, yes, very easy, good on the limbs on an exercise bike to sit, you know, pedal, sprint. But most people are sitting too much. So when you come into a gym, to, to someone like me, it's the worst possible thing to do to then sit in the gym. So unless you have to, 
look for a piece of equipment, a treadmill. With the treadmill, you use the incline. And I've checked this with my heart rate monitor. The heart rate goes up more quickly the more you increase the incline than it does running. So for those of you who really don't like running, <laughs> the incline does the trick. So you see what I mean? There's a safe environment, but you understand the science now. It, it used to be people would come in and they'd say to me, should I do the bike or the cross trainer or the treadmill? You know, and it's like, it doesn't matter. It's what your heart rate is doing. So when you think about what you're doing, it's what can I do that supports where my body's at that's going to get my heart rate up quickly. I think swimming's difficult to track, those of you who might enjoy swimming, because it's, I personally don't have a heart rate monitor that's waterproof, so you can't tell, but I'd say that would be quite a difficult one to really monitor. But everything else, you, it's just what is it that you're doing that can get your heart rate to where you want it to be. So that is that. And so these HIIT classes you see in gyms where they're doing weight training, kettlebells, so there's a good uh, different, the difference there. You're getting your strength training, which is essential, but it is spiking the heart rate up to get some fat burning effect. But if you're purely looking at your fat loss cardiovascular session, as I said, use the equipment that, uh, or resources you have that allow you to get your heart rate up. You want to alternate them. Give all your energy to your cardiovascular session, then give all your energy to your strength training session, so that's why just half an hour, you know, this is five minutes warm up or to get the walk to your park or wherever you're going. About 20 minutes you're aiming for to get yourself in that zone, bit of a recovery, half an hour. A good weight session, half an hour. And how often is the week? Is it a good question, no more than twice a week. Oh. So with the strength training, if we're doing like a full body strength training, and I mentioned this recovery and fatigue recovery, so we're traveling along here, we fatigue the muscles, they're going to repair, all the metabolic stuff's repairing. As they repair, they come back up. Ideally, we've had a bit of growth and, they, and we hit them there and we create fatigue. So that's about 48 hours. So with strength training, you should not do that within the 48 hour window. And they say a bit similarly for HIIT training because your metabolic effect is ongoing. So you want to hit any of your energy systems, whether it's strength, flexibility, cardiovascular, <coughs> completely recovered from the last one, so you can hit it hard and fast and get on with the day. So this is the less is more theory. <laughs> Yes, uh, Arthur was talking before about, I think she was about, and you get to a certain age, 30, 40, you know, you're, you're losing muscle mass anyway on a downward trend. So you're going to adapt this training as you're getting older, you're going to be focusing more on um, weight sort of training aspects. 100%. Yes. Uh, retention. Yes. And obviously this all depends on your goals, and obviously I'm speaking here to fat loss and that's not everyone's goal. Yeah. When you're talking strength training, and it's been evidence that you can, I mean my goal when working with people with weight loss and introducing strength training is the base level is to not lose any muscle mass. Because it's going to take a while to be working at the level you need to to build muscle and the dietary elements. So not losing it is first goal. But for someone whose pure goal is strength training, and, you know, about a month of adaption and then you should be able to move into the sets and reps and loads and the nutrient balance that mm. even as you age can yeah. reverse some of those effects. I mean, being on keto, keto is sort of like a diet, you know, I personally have lost a lot of weight, so, but then you look at your body and sort of profile and it's, you have the muscle mass. Exactly. Yep. You've lost a pile of weight, you yep. feel better, but you're still not. So For longevity, yeah. and you know, yep. and you see the age people, and you know what disturbs me is the walkers. Mm. Mm. They're like this. And I mean, you know, my, my parents, uh, my mum passed away last year, you know, so, um, but prior to that, even it was like a scene, and I said this to them, and I had a laugh at Faulty Towers. Mm. You'd go around to visit, and Dad would be in the lounge, and she'd be reading the train. 
And you know, it's beginning to sort of angle down this way. And you're just kind of sitting there thinking, well, I'm not going to jump in because they do this every day when you're not here. This is, this is getting like a bit challenging. And as I said, it was really like that guy from Poulton Towers, you know, the way that, you know. And the, the whole system was just going this way. And it just, there's no reason why it needs to. You know, of course there's obvious effects of ageing, but you, you move your body properly. Can it be reversed? What's that? This? Yes. I mean, to a degree. So we utilise a lot of mobilisation, foam rolling. Uh, technically, the story is when we're working with posture is there's an opposite dynamic. Something's weak, something's tight. So people who begin to have these postural issues think they need to strengthen their back, do back strengthening exercises. The thing is the opposing muscles in the front have become so tight and if we've been sitting like this for 10 years before we've decided to do anything about it, it's going to take more than the odd trip in, in a gym doing an opening exercise because you'll wake up the next day and the muscles have pulled it back in. So myotherapists are really good at, at that and um, they, because just that sort of chronic condition, you're just doing what we would traditionally do a sort of um, doorway stretch, you know, that's going to be not going to be enough <laughs> uh, when we've got this chronic issue rolling in. So yin yoga, if any of you have got a yoga studio near you that does yin yoga, they work on lying on bolsters and opening up actually the fascia, which is the connective tissue around the muscles and the next layer, which releases, you know, if the muscles are tight, we do something, they get pulled back if you play into the fascia, which the myotherapy your deep tissue massage in yoga does, it allows those muscles to release. So we need to loosen what's tight and strengthen what's weak. So it's a twofold approach. And if you're committed to that, it is definitely doable. But as I said, when it's chronic, you need a myotherapist or someone, a deep remedial massage therapist to get in and help, and that's very unpleasant. I had my muscle near the sternocleidomastoid, so forward head carriage, right? This, that's, we see now it's getting worse and worse. Just doing exercises to straighten your neck up somehow, your shoulders have you've gotten tight there, the muscles keep pulling back. So this muscle here. So I had a my therapist getting to those a few times. That was just like, you know, screaming kind of skirts. It's not fun. So you need to be committed, is what I'm saying, to the process. Even, you know, these muscles here, you've got your pec muscles, your minor and major, and sometimes they'll get right in under the pec muscle to release it. So that is on that. And of course I've spent so long on my fitness talk that it's going to uh, I can do a modified mindset talk, but I think maybe we'll have some afternoon tea and then I'll do a very quick talk, you know, to just get the point across because I did email you all, those of you who are on the list, D, Dr. D. Martini's values, and I have got a hard copy here for those of you, so I will refer to where that comes in after this and how to utilise those. So we've got the wonderful cupcakes, I've got some other lovely things in the fridge from Regretless Cafe.